tuning in this afternoon or this morning. And it's my tremendous pleasure to be asked to introduce Professor Walter um, Wittich, who is recently promoted, I believe, to Associate Professor at School of Optometry at the University of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. Um, so I think this is the second Canadian talk we've had this year, so welcome. And um, I'll just give a little bit of background. So um, Walter, you have a background in visual neuroscience from McGill, and then you took a postdoctoral fellowship in audiology. So you're one of the very rare people who has expertise in both vision and hearing and cognition. And um, so I think you are one of the leaders in the dual sensory impairment and uh, acquired blindness. And you hold a number of positions, including the inaugural chair of the DeafBlind International Research Network, the chair of the Visual Impairment Rehabilitation Access of the Quebec Vision Health Research Network, you're a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and also Quebec's first certified low vision therapist. So um, yeah, a, a multi-talented and um, uh, individual who's going to talk to us today. And the title of your talk is Screening for Cognitive Impairment in Old Adults with Single or Dual Sensory Loss, namely vision or hearing. And you'll be talking about tools and strategies. So I'll hand it over to you for about 40 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erasima, for inviting me, for introducing me. This is very exciting. I, of course, always love talking about this topic. It is my specialty. And so I'm going to invite you here into my computer today to tell you a little about these things. Uh, now, um, I, as you say, I, I have this interest in things that are complicated. I started with one impairment, then I added the next one, and as my career seems to unfold, other things seem to add themselves. So I, uh, I seem to be comfortable with, you know, complexity. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm trying to do today, is introduce you to how to be more comfortable with some of the complexity that we end up facing when we deal with old uh, older adults that have multiple impairments. Now, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that Montreal is located on unseen indigenous land. Uh, I know that in a North American context or even in Australia, this is something that we often do at the beginning of presentations. In Europe, this may not necessarily be uh, that commonly the case, but I want to do this today anyway. Uh, the Ganyangaharga nation is recognized as the custodians of the land and the waters from which I present to you today. And Chachaga is otherwise known as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples, and I want to express my respect for the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relations with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Now, as we move forward, I'll start out by giving you a mini disclosure on the financial side. I'm currently funded by a career award, a junior two career award that is uh, funded by the province of Quebec. I've got various uh, peer reviewed sources of funding. I'm going to acknowledge that some of my Assistive device research in vision and dual sensory loss is funded by industry and by uh, partnerships through an organization called MITAX, which uh, matches industry funds through government funding. Uh, but I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare for the content of what I'm presenting today. The first thing I want to do is sort of do a tip of the hat to the fact that this sensory cognitive research world is not brand new. There have been quite a few people that have sort of built the ground building blocks for what, uh, what we are interested in today. And so there are long standing known correlations between age and declines in vision, increasing age and declines in hearing, and various associations between aging and changes in cognitive function. And so Lindenberg and Baltus were among the first to really put this together conceptually and to examine this question of whether uh, the link between cognition and age may or may not be mediated or moderated by changes in vision and how this picture may hang together. So uh, we're starting, starting out of, out. Uh, sorry, there was an echo somewhere. So starting out of this, uh, some of you may probably have seen this figure by now that comes out of the Lancet by Livingston and, uh, and her uh, team 
hearing loss is associated with changes in cognition and it turns out to be the one factor that is potentially preventable or treatable that contributes to uh, cognitive changes later in life. This is also true for vision impairment, but it turns out that vision was not included in Livingston's model, and that's for a very interesting reason. Speaking to her about this, she told us that there wasn't enough literature on the topic that would be able to be eligible to be included. So I see this as a challenge for myself uh, to now generate some of this literature because I still believe that vision plays an important role here, even though it was not included in this model at the time. And of course, my special interest is dual sensory impairment when you suddenly have the combination of vision and hearing loss. And it turns out what we're now trying to solve is whether this combination of both senses is additive, whether it may actually be multiplicative. Uh, so vision plus hearing may not equal two. Uh, it may be equaling more. And it could also be that there is something that we call sort of a cognitive cliff that people may go over once certain levels of sensory loss are reached, but again, too early for us to base opinions on data. Now, there are a couple of reasons of how this all may work. Uh, there is something called the common cause hypothesis. And so here the idea is that really something that underlies aging is what changes cognition early on and later on, and that this is exactly the same story for the senses as they move forward. Another way of looking at this is actually the cognitive load on perception hypothesis. Here, we would postulate that changes in cognition actually reduce our ability to process sensory information. And so the cause of the changes we see in sensory functioning may actually be rooted in changes in cognition. This may work the other way around, which we call the information degradation hypothesis. Here, the question is, whether degraded sensory information is actually responsible for downstream cognitive uh, reports, measurements, and abilities, or whether this now actually may have a time factor in it. The sensory deprivation hypothesis would state that sensory loss over time will affect how cognition works by reducing or depriva deprivating the brain of information or whether this exact relationship may actually be socially mediated and where sensory impairments, for example, may reduce social engagement, social participation, problems with vision and or hearing may isolate people and this social isolation has cognitive downstream results. In reality, chances are this is probably all happening at the same time. It's a complicated model. It's a complicated way of viewing the world and of course, one would need tremendous data sets to play with this. And so that is uh, what some of our team members here in Canada are trying to do as well. So now, just because I can, it turns out, I want to remind us that not everything actually gets worse as we get older. That would be terribly depressing. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with vision, there's something called vernia acuity. This is our ability to align two things uh, that is something that is unaffected by the aging process. Uh, this is a skill where we have extremely high resolution because visual information is integrated over the entire visual field and larger cortical networks are required to make this judgment of whether two things are aligned. Um, in the Canadian context, if any of you have ever been to Toronto, if you are downtown at the Toronto campus of the University of Toronto and you look at CN Tower, which is this big tower that stands downtown, if we would displace the tower in the middle by the width of one brick, you would actually be able to tell from a distance of about one to two kilometers. So this is a highly refined visual skill and that turns out not to be affected by the aging process. This also applies to aspects of hearing. For example, the benefit of spatial separation of speakers during speech perception. The fact that people speak to you from different directions helps you in speech perception and that is something that is unaffected by the aging process as well. And then of course, even though we have many cognitive functions where we have strong data to observe changes over time with aging, there are some that get better. Turns out language, vocabulary, 
the way we speak improves, the way we write improves. As we get older, we have more vocabulary. We have better ways of structuring a thought and use language as we get older. And so what is also fascinating in this is to consider that older adults in general, even if they lack something in processing, they can compensate for these impairments through context and experience. And that is why on the surface, many times you will get similar scores or performance measures in older adults as you would get in younger adults, but how they get there is different. I want to quickly introduce our Canadian team. This is the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. This is a large 350 plus team of researchers and team 17 is the, the gang that deals with sensory and cognitive questions. The overall goal of the CCNA is to study anything and everything dementia and neurodegeneration in order to improve assessments, improve treatments. Uh, this goes from molecular things all the way to population health. So we're distributed quite widely al along the range. <clears throat> Team 17 specifically focuses on the census. So we have Natalie Phillips, who is a cognitive neuropsychologist. Uh, Alison Chastine, who deals with stigma. This is a social psychologist. Jennifer Campos does multisensory integration in aging. Kathy Picora Fuller is a powerhouse in the world of audiology. Don Guthrie knows how to deal with large data sets. JB Orange and Marisa Andranayagam uh, deal with speech and language pathology and communication interruptions as dementia develops. And Paul Mick is an otolaryngologist, uh, our uh, MD on the team. Uh, you have something similar in Europe. Uh, if you have questions about SenseCog, Irasema is the lady to talk to. Uh, she knows this team inside out. So here, the, the, some of the mission of SenseCog is similar to what we do in Team 17. And just for the balance of things, there's a similar team that has been built in the United States that works inside the American Geriatric Society and the National Institute of Aging. All of us know each other, all of us somehow collaborate with each other, and we have lots of information to share with each other to move this sensory cognitive agenda forward. So the challenge we face is that, of course, the large majority of cognitive screening and assessment tools and techniques require or presume that vision and hearing are good. Right? These are tests that require you to see stimuli, hear instructions, communicate with the person who is actually administering the test, and then you need to respond. So there's an entire setup that requires vision and hearing. The solutions to this, in the case of doing this with people that have vision and hearing problems, deal with visibility, audibility, administration strategies, and some alternatives. And so the rest of the time that I have today, I want to look at those solutions and point out some things that may be useful, whether you are a researcher or a clinician, uh, I hope you gain something from this today. I'll start out, of course, with something that's close to my heart, and that's the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, because I live in Montreal. Uh, some of you may be familiar. This is a screening tool built to detect mild cognitive impairment in its original version. It has visual items as well. The rest is, uh, requires on hearing, uh, depends on hearing for its administration. And it gives you a total of 30 points where you need to get 26 or more to be considered low risk or no risk. Now, about 10 years ago, we validated what we call the blind mocha. And the way the blind mocha works is that the visual items are simply eliminated and during the, the uh, validation of this, we then reevaluated how to score this because many people may simply just subtract the number of points that we've taken out from the total score. And so we ended up examining what happens to the blind mocha if you choose different cutoff scores. And so instead of taking an absolute difference in the number of points that were taken up, we decided to do this proportionally and look at a relative reduction. Turns out, compared to the full version, the specificity is better. Turns out the sensitivity drops down. Now, it drops. It's not a total disaster, but it's not great either. So the reason why uh, this is, is because the domains that have been eliminated through the visual items deal a lot with executive functioning. And that is a domain that you would want to screen for. So ideally, uh, these items are not lost and would need to be adapted somehow elsewhere. You can also see, just as a mini aside, 
that the mini mental, which we used in uh, comparison here as well, is actually not that good at all in detecting mild cognitive impairment, simply because the test is a lot easier. And so we will come back to the mini mental just in a moment. Here it is. For those of you who are familiar with the mini mental, of course, it also has items that are dependent on vision. It's also scored over 30. Uh, but there's quite a bit of research already existing in the blind mini mental as well as its telephone version. And so here, there are se uh, several items that are eliminated. Again, same idea here. You now score out of 22 instead of 30, uh, and the cutoff is done in its absolute value. Uh, again, you lose something. Right? This is the idea. The moment you simply reduce a test, it's not going to be as strong as its original, but you have an alternative that you can use for people where vision is a problem. There's another alternative, which is called the Telephone Interview for Cognitive Status, the TICS. Uh, if you've never seen this, it's a few pages long. I just wanted to show you here on page one, many of the items are similar that you would orient people in terms of time and place. Uh, you would do some mental exercises in doing counting. Uh, you know, so the, the context and the content of these screening tools is relatively similar. Um, if they are developed for the telephone, the assumption is that you could use them face to face as well if somebody does not have uh, sufficient vision for a visual component. Something that I wanted to point out out of curiosity, if you're not screening, but you actually want to evaluate something, there are a list of options in cognition where you have cognitive tests that are verbal or auditory only and do not require vision at all. One of my favorites is the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test or the Raveled. It's designed to evaluate verbal memory. And here you simply present verbally uh, a list of words to your participant, to your patient, whoever the person may be. Uh, you do this uh, a, 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 a number of times. You do this actually five times and give them immediate free recall. You then present an interference list of other words and give them immediate free recall on how many of these uh, words they remember. You then ask them to remember words from the first list, so you do a bit of uh, measurement in the presence of interference, and then you do a recall 20 minutes later. So here you look at uh, encoding, and then finally you do a, uh, another recognition test where you actually have words from the first, the second list, and some new words that are sometimes phonetically or content-wise similar just to get a better idea. So now this is beautiful because you don't need vision for this at all. Uh, so that is a definite alternative if you want to go a little deeper than just screening. When we get to audibility, uh, one of my favorite discoveries was this paper that was published by Lynn and the team uh, on a hearing impaired version of the MOCA. So here what they simply did is turn the entire test into a PowerPoint presentation that comes with written instructions. And now, no more hearing is required. The test can basically be uh, self-administered, so to speak, by the person reading the instructions while they are in the room with the person who is administering and scoring the test as you go forward. And so instead of having to hear, they have to read. Now, of course, what's interesting here is that this presumption is that vision is okay, right? So this is, I think, always an interesting challenge that the vision adapted versions of the tests require normal hearing. The hearing adapted tests require normal or at least near normal vision in order to be able to compensate. That's an old story and we deal the best we can. I also thought I should give you an example of when we go all the way to no hearing. There is actually the British Sign Language Cognitive Screening Test that is available for people that are culturally deaf and that actually require sign language interpretation in order to be tested. Uh, I've given you the example here of the picture naming section of this test. Given uh, the importance of visual information in this text, in this test, there are more items to be named. You know, there's a heavier uh, reliance on the recognition of objects in this case. I also want to point out something interesting that the vision scientists in you may uh, immediately see that, for example, the calendar here or some of the items uh, like the thermometer or the church, some of the information of these pictures requires you to see detail. 
And so this is more easily recognizable if you have fine vision, whereas some of the information is like, for example, the battery, the only detail information is the plus and minus. But even if you wouldn't have the plus and minus, the shape and the way it is presented may still trigger you to know that this is a battery. So uh, the level of visual function, whether people have the ability to resolve high spatial frequencies or not, will play a role and that will become a bit more important in something I want to show you later on. There are some general uh, administration strategies that I want to talk about that are important specifically when you deal with cognition in the context of people with a sensory impairment. And the first one is to take your time. I think that, uh, of course, for clinicians, this is going to be the barrier number one because we need to get things done, right? So we need to get there and ideally get there quickly, given that the waiting room is full. However, reducing the stress for people with sensory loss is a key piece in the assessment. And I think that if you allow more time, you will get further in this process. What is also super useful is to see whether you can choose tests that actually do not rely on time, because there are multiple cognitive tests that are timed for doing some task inside of a minute or half a minute. If you can choose items that do not depend on time, allowing for more time goes together. And again, the stress and pressure of time goes away. If you look at strategies that are vision related, uh, simple visual communication strategy to use is to face your participant or your patient when you do whatever it is you do. Uh, there's quite a bit of research about speech recognition and lip reading and speech reading uh, in the context of vision loss. And there was a long-standing belief that if you have an acuity of 2200, for example, and you would be considered legally blind, that speech cues, for example, are not useful. But it turns out that that's not wrong, uh, that's not right, because even body posture, the angle of the head, uh, the fact that you are or are not moving while you speak will give key pieces of context for example, whether you're joking or not, or whether you're laughing or not. This is information that is otherwise lost. So facing your communication partner is an important uh, piece. You want to avoid glare behind you. This is uh, probably now very well known by anybody who's ever used Zoom before, that if you have a Zoom uh, communicator who sits in front of a window, uh, Irasima had a uh, do, done a mini demonstration for this earlier because in the hotel room where she is today there is a, a curtain behind her that she needs to close so we can see her face. The moment we have uh, glare behind us your face will become entirely black and so all speech cues are lost. Another item that I want to point out is that whenever you have the possibility to magnify or to provide large print materials if this is possible I would go for it. Uh, it turns out you don't need to be visually impaired for this to be useful. This can be useful for anybody. And it would actually go into the concepts of universal accessibility because uh, people will find large print often calming, especially under the stressful situation of being tested for a cognitive skill. I wanted to show you what this may look like in the context of a CCTV. Here is a tabletop version of this where you can magnify what you would see as otherwise rather tiny text. And so you can literally administer something like the mini mental or the mocha or many other cognitive tests that are not timed by having the participant or the patient magnify them in this situation because it may take time for them to see what it is they need to see, but you will actually get at their cognitive skill instead of their visual skill. There are also portable versions of this. You can see this lady here in the bookstore with a mini portable CCTV that you could take on the road in case you're doing home calls. Magnification works. It turns out it doesn't always work. We did a study a while ago where we actually used at items of the Hoopa visual organization test, which you can see at the top part of the screen here. And so what we uh, studied here was the performance of the test with people that had age-related macular degeneration, and we compared that to age-matched normals that had normal vision. So it turns out that if you use something like the Hooper, these shapes are large and they don't require necessarily fine detail because you have information in the outline of things. And that actually allows even visually impaired people to perform relatively well. But when you look at other tests, like for example, 
uh, items of the waste. Uh, here is the, uh, the digit symbol replacement test. This requires fine detailed vision because you need to be able to see each of these symbols. So even when we uh, magnified this, uh, one of the things that makes this test difficult is that it is timed and you are supposed to replace digits with symbols according to the instruction inside of a certain time limit. If we make things larger, of course, the distance between looking at the symbol and the code becomes larger. Filling this out will take more time. And so immediately our people with visual impairment scored a lot lower and we may not know whether that is their vision or whether that is the adaptation to the test. If we have hearing related strategies, I want to talk about the importance of avoiding noise. Uh, I am in a room right now with a fan. Uh, it probably may not be perceptible for everybody, but it is there. If you're working in offices with air conditioning, uh, where you can feel or hear the fan, if you're near a road, if you're near a construction site, if you are in a room with other people that don't appear to be able to shut up while you're doing your assessment, that does happen. So sometimes we need to step up and interfere with noise in order to uh, create an environment that is as calm as possible because this uh, background noise will interfere with hearing and therefore will create some kind of additional burden on the processing, the cognitive processing of the information that is being heard. Don't yell. Uh, it turns out the threshold for pain uh, based on somebody screaming at you is the same in somebody with a hearing loss as it would be in somebody with normal hearing. It's just that that range of audibility is more narrow and it takes a little bit of tuning to figure out what is the optimal volume to communicate with somebody, but you do want to avoid yelling. It's not really going to be all that helpful. Speaking clearly will simply require you to slow down a bit and make sure you pronounce and elocute as you should, and uh, it will do miracles for you. Give context. Uh, if you are about to change topic, if you're about to change test, if you are introducing a new idea, do this right away about your vision test. Suddenly we know, okay, now we're talking about something that is related to vision. It was fill, it will facilitate speech, speech perception simply because now the vocabulary that people may be guessing while they are communicating is already reduced. It's something about vision. All right, I know what to pay attention to. And then of course, uh, if you do get to information that is essential, especially if it's instructions for somebody to do something or to act on something, or whether it is instructions of how to take your medications at home. Ask people to repeat this information back to you. It's that simple. You will actually now know not only whether they heard you, but whether it was processed to the point that it was understood and it come back to you in the correct way. The best $100 or let's say 80 euros you will spend in your clinic at any point is the purchase of a pocket talker. Not everybody is a fan of the pocket talker and it's not always the best tool for everything. But if you've never heard of this, it looks a little bit like an old style Walkman. It's got that little handheld piece that has a battery in it and then headphones. The pocket talker has a directional microphone and a possibility to adjust the volume. What this is, is a personal amplification, amplification device that you can put on if people have forgotten their hearing aid, if the battery is dead, or if they've sever, simply never tried a hearing aid, but obviously there's a communication barrier. And if they're open-minded to try it out, why not try it out? It's actually quite interesting. I use the pocket talker as an example of a gateway drug for hearing aids, because many people in our research context that do not use hearing aids, try out the pocket talker during our administration of various things and fall in love with us asking where they can get this. And then later on end up getting hearing aids in order to facilitate the auditory experience that they have with the pocket talker. So of course now, what happens if both things go wrong at the same time? You'd think that this is relatively rare, but it turns out that's not true. At a population level, uh, the World Federation of the Deafblind tells us that there are roughly between 0.2 and 2% of the world's population 
that have combined vision and hearing loss. But this depends very much on the development status of the country. So we decided to do a mini scoping review and look at prevalence of combined vision and hearing loss, in this case, based on things like visual acuity or audiograms in populations over the age of 50. And you'll see here, so we've got the various studies listed and the prevalence that is reported that for people over the age of 50, most studies sort of give us an idea that this prevalence over the age of 50 is around 5%. The size of these bubbles, by the way, is representative of the sample size of each of these studies. But it turns out there are a couple of subpopulations that fall out of this five pop. So for example, if we look at people that live in residential care, people where, uh, surprise, surprise, dementia is also higher, this population prevalence moves up to about 20%. If we look at populations that live in rural environments that have uh, rare access to the same kind of health care uh, and service delivery that you would have in an urban environment, this moves up to 35%. If we look at people with hip fractures, we're around 30%. Uh, hip fractures I found interesting because that implies often that there's a fall. Uh, mobility and hearing have been linked uh, in terms of risk for falls is, are higher in people that have a hearing loss. So suddenly these numbers become rather high. Uh, so to be considered as you look at your own clientele or your participants. We've got an opportunity in Canada where we use the interi measures. These are measures of uh, global levels of functioning. Uh, and so one of our team members in Team 17, Don Guthrie, uh, looked at large, large data sets that span entire provinces in Canada with uh, multiple million data points. I have no idea how she manages, but she does. And so she was interested in the proportion of people that live at home, but receive home care. And it turns out having a sensory impairment, you know, it does happen, but it turns out these numbers are much higher when you look at the comorbidity of sensory and cognitive loss. But what is really scary is that if you now compare this to people that are transferred from home care into long-term care, only having a sensory impairment actually drops down quite a bit. But the numbers of having comorbidity with cognition climb quickly. And so here we can say that roughly two thirds of people that live in long-term care have cognitive and sensory impairment. It's that simple. And of course, the people that I'm most interested in is the triple threat when everything comes together. What do we do now? There are some interesting alternatives for testing cognition in dual sensory impairment. I don't know if any of you remember this toy from growing up. The idea here was to put the triangle through the triangle hole and the round thing through the round thing, right? These are important lessons to be learned as we grow up. Uh, if you want to have some good entertainment, there's a beautiful YouTube video that was taken by somebody who had decided that their suit plate is going to fit up there, but it was absolutely clear to anybody who grew up with this toy that this would not be the case. So important cognitive lesson for all to be learned. Uh, you need to know that the round thing goes into the round hole. It turns out this idea has been used in the assessment of cognition with people that are deafblind, because you can now relate on tactile skill. Uh, this, in this case, is mostly used with people that also uh, respond to tactile sign language or where presentation of instruction can still be done in an auditory way, but otherwise the testing materials would not be accessible. And so here you can actually evaluate spatial memory uh, there is a tactile foam board test. Uh, you can do clock reading on a three-dimensional clock that has hands on it. Uh, or as you can see uh, on the right side, this is the object shape uh, a naming test. Uh, also, you can use it for the spatial memory test and you can have people name fingers. You know, so there, there are various ways of getting to this without uh, vision or hearing. Some of you may be familiar with the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. Uh, it has a short-term memory test in it with these black, uh, with these red and white uh, cubes where you're instructed to make shapes of various um, complexities. 
It turns out there is a tactile version of this. So here you have the same cubes and you have to recreate uh, the shape patterns that are indicated. But now you have cubes where one side has a tiny piece of astroturf on it. So you have some tactile information and the other ones are simply flat and smooth with a polished wooden surface. So again, you can ad administer this kind of short-term memory test through a tactile modality and you get gain access. There are limitations to all of this. Uh, so for some of these tests, we still assume that participants can verbally respond. This is relevant specifically in the context of stroke patients that may have some form of aphasia where uh, a verbal response is not an option anymore. Uh, if you are dealing with somebody who is culturally deaf, but you don't have an interpreter, they may be properly responding to you, but you have no idea to understand of how to understand their way of communicating. Right? So interpreters are required. This all takes more time. There's no way around it. No matter which way you turn it, assessing cognition through sensory barriers will take time. If you don't have this time, this may not be the right field for you because uh, otherwise you will miss stuff that is essential. There is at times extra equipment required, like I showed you in the, in the tactile tests, because not always are these things able on pen and paper. Uh, there are some uh, apps in development. I have not yet found anything that I would recommend to you today, but there are ways of tactile interface uh, through tactile screens. Uh, some of these devices will vibrate for you as a response, you know, so there are ways of getting some tactile information, but we're not quite there yet that I would be recommending any of these. Many of these things are not possible to do in a context of telehealth. Now that we're doing webinars online because it is impossible for me to be in Dublin this week, for example, uh, some of these tests, are, well, most of these tests are not validated through telehealth. Uh, turns out we're actually working on something like this, uh, but again, I'm not yet ready to show you something that would be useful. And then, of course, that is the key piece. We're looking for things that are validated, that have test-retest variability assessed and judged in such a way that have clear instructions on how to administer so you know what you're doing. And many of these standards and validated comparisons don't exist yet. Walter, just remind you, four minutes, thanks. Perfect timing for all of us. So why do we care? Uh, there are demographic developments now that force us to think about the complexity of the needs of our clients. As people grow older, as life uh, expectancy expands, as the number of older people increases, we need to think about this because the needs of our participants, the needs of our clients change. We need to change with them. This is scientific evolution at work. If we want to do work that is relevant to our population, we need to look into this. I want to recommend three things in case you want to go further from here. Uh, Natalie Phillips and I did uh, a webinar that, where I, Irma Sema had invited us through the Dementia Academy, where we speak a little bit about some of these adaptation uh, items that I talked about. Uh, Natalie Phillips also presented together with Paul Mick, who is our ENT, on the team about seeing, hearing, and thinking, uh, looking at data from the Canadian longitudinal study on aging, specifically of how the sensory and cognitive variables link up. And they also mentioned some of the work that I presented in the same series of the Canadian longitudinal study where we bring together some of the cognitive and social variables in this population. Because social activity does play a role, but it does not always play the role we think it would or that it should. So there's a long list of people that I thank without whom I would not be able to do what I do. And if you want to know more or follow us, uh, we have a Twitter account for our team and also for myself where I play around and let the world know what we do. And now we still have a little bit of time. So I'd be most delighted to discuss and ask questions and see where we go from here. Thank you so much.